your warmth, your charity, your reach out, your love, your care for fellow tennis professionals never stops. Very recently, you brought down one of your players that played at the academy. You developed his career. He started to teach for seven or eight years in New York. Now he's ending his last tennis run. You brought him down because he wanted one more time to spend the good life with you. Well, first of all, um, when I received a phone call, he said, Nick, my dream is to see the academy, the ocean, and you. So I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm dying of cancer. So I went to all my friends. We raised the money along with my manager and we brought him down for four days to see the academy. We got a rental car, we got a place for him to stay and spending money. And this is what it's all about. Dick Vitale generously gave a check and all my other friends and his last dream has come true. And I'm also going to send him a Hall of Frame picture and uh, thank him for all that he's meant to tennis and to keep fighting. Mark, tennis is your life. You traveled the world playing as a professional. Then you taught as a coach. But the tennis ball took a bad bounce with a long bout of neck head cancer. It's great to be with you today. Thank you. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. Hey, you got into this game of tennis. It's kind of a fishy story. It is. I've always fished my whole life. My dad wanted me to try something different out. Paid for a half hour lesson, which I hated. I fought. I kicked sand and seashells and fought the, the nets and the heat and did not want to be there. And by the second ball I hit, the magic got into me and it got my blood and I've never looked back. Fast forward, next thing you know, you're down here in Sarasota with Nick Bolletieri at the Nick Bolletieri Academy. Now, of course, it's IMG, Nick Bolletieri Academy. What was that life like for you? At first, it was, uh, it took um, a while to get acclimated to the climate, to um, being away from home, to being around a number of uh, foreigners, which I wasn't used to. But I adapted. Nick and his staff made me feel welcome, made me feel at home, even though at first I was in one of the lower groups, so I wasn't anything worth looking at. I got I got lucky one day that the, they had some representatives from different clothing companies, and the rep from Nike happened to be on my court, and it was when Andre Agassi was making his uh, uprising, if you will. The guy that was on my court liked the way I... Uh, you like the way you look. You're a good-looking guy. Well, thank you, but it was more my attitude. Well, I was hitting the ball between my legs. I was, I was showing off. I was hitting the ball at other people, making a fool of myself, and he said... You know, you're the type of person that we want Nike to represent. The direction we want Nike to go is what you are. Can we sit down with you and your manager, who happened to be from IMG? A little rebellious, a little rebel in you, and totally uninhibited. But you're down here with Jimmy Arias, Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, one of my students, Carling Bassett, and others. What was that like? What kind of friendships will you have forever with these guys and girls? It quickly became a bond. A lot of it was formed, you know, off the court because they were a lot better than I at that time where they were already at the top of their game in their early career. But once it took off, you know, and, and once everything gelled together, it, there were relationships that were that will forever be be there, you know, and uh, and uh, will always be family. You hit it big on the juniors. What was junior tennis like on the junior national tennis circuit for you, Mark? Very rough, very um, unpredictable. Nobody expected me to do much, especially the Orange Bowl. Told my dad that I would bring him home a trophy 
He didn't believe me. He had his own Union Cooling Company in Indiana. Wanted me to go into that. So he thought tennis was a phase. The best way I can describe it is tennis not only got my blood. You know, tennis chose me. I didn't choose it. I followed through with, with my dream and, and I it took off from there. Let's go down memory lane with technology because you were there when rackets were taking a big change and you were a kid, so you were having a ball out there. What were some of the rackets that you started using that were breakthroughs in technology? I remember playing with a head aluminum. My first graphite was a Prince graphite and I've stuck with Prince ever since. You are a man of loyalty. I know that. <laughs> you spent time with Nick Bulletary. How much influence did he have on your life? Does he still have on your life? He does. He did. He always will. Nick is um, one of the best coaches I've ever run across. And I've been lucky enough to meet several, several Davis Cup coaches. Nick, he's always got something positive. He always has something encouraging. He keeps you wanting to do better, finds anything and everything positive in your game, and polishes that. Mark, who else had an influence on your early years, through the juniors, through the early part of your pro career? There was a gentleman uh, that my dad knew who was a, a local pro here in Bradenton, Lombok Key, who got me started. He was the one that gave me my first lesson with a uh, old wooden Junior McGregor racket. He was a wonderful guy. A couple of uh, coaches through voluntary that will always be in my heart. I owe my uh, career to them. As a kid growing up, who was a, a model player for you? To whom did you look up as a player? John McEnroe was probably one of my biggest heroes. I got to know him on a personal basis and I got to realize that 90% of his uh, antics were just what they were, antics. It was part of a show. I've only seen John mad twice. You know, actually mad. He would do stuff to get in the heads of his opponent, to get in the heads of the chair umpire, of the linesman, even the ball kid. Anyone he could to get to get the edge. Andre Agassi, you played a lot of practice sets with that guy, and I see you grimace as I'm saying that. What was Andre like at the academy? Did he fit in? Very vain. Andre, at first, he was, uh, I think, kind of forced to go there. I mean, he was a wonderful, wonderful player from ever, forever. I think his, his dad, Mike, and his brother, Philip, had a big part with his uh, playing. Mike, I can see, played a big, big role. He had to make a decision to go to college, go on the pro tour. You decided to go on the pro tour. You saw the world. You saw the world as a journeyman. You were playing minor league tennis and the challengers in the futures. You played the qualifiers. You saw it all. What was it like touring the world as a journeyman minor league professional player? The hardest part was realizing that you had to win the eat. Qualifiers, they weren't guaranteed five-star hotels. It was rough, and it was difficult to be able to not take that on the court with you. Describe your style of play. What kind of player were you? You were getting into the, the big game. The all-court game was taking a back seat, the explosive forehand the cannonball serve. Tell us about your type of style, your game, Mark. I never had a very hard serve. <laughs> my serve was much to me desired. I think my hardest ever was around 130 miles an hour. So I relied more on spin. I was a better doubles player than singles. Uh, I had a good doubles partner who carried me. Todd Nelson? He didn't have a doubles partner at the time. And so we made an agreement for that tournament. One thing led to another and we became partners and uh, I got to know him and his family real well and they accepted me as part of their family. Todd was great. Todd was, uh, he had uh, thigh muscles of a tree trunk. Todd was a 
very um, grounded. Todd kept me grounded. Where I was more flamboyant, I guess is the word. I would um, notice stuff where Todd's focusing more on the match. I'm looking at the third girl. Top on the left, there's a song that's by an alternative group called Sale. In that song, it says, uh, I can blame it on my ADD. I had ADD very much, and it was obvious because uh, Gabe, Gabriel, who was my coach, and Jose, like their last names, and chemo brain, don't go well together. You know, Todd kept me focused at what I needed to be focusing on, which was the match at hand. Mark, what was it like playing your last match on the Pro Tour? What memories do you have of that one? I didn't know it prior to the match. I didn't know it in the first set. I didn't know it in the second set. But eventually, I figured out that this is it. I took time to uh, look around, gather my thoughts, gather my emotions. I remember, I always will, it being the last time that uh, I picked up a racket and played a match as a pro. Soon though, you started coaching tennis in the Big Apple. You like that fast lane. Moved to New York, coached there nearly a decade. What were you proud to hand down to your students that you had learned traveling the tour and being with Balateri and being at IMG? Honesty. I never lied to a student. I may have stretched the truth a little bit, but I focused on their good points and what I could do to make their good points better. And I hope I did that. They were a better player and a better person because of it. Mark, we are together at the IMG Voluntary Tennis Academy. Most people know IMG as a tennis dynasty, as an athletic dynasty that produces champions. IMG is a great deal more than that. IMG, Nick Voluntary, and Dick Vitale knew of your condition and that you wanted to have another visit here to be in the development home of where you were a kid, what was going on. They made it happen. They brought you down here. What will IMG and the Nick Boletari family always mean to you, Mark Schilling? They did whatever it took to make me feel like part of the family. You know, you're part of the Boletari family. You always will be. We will always be there for you. Nick, when I saw him that first day, you just get that feeling in your heart comes genuine. I love Nick, and I believe that Nick, in his own way, loves me too. Mark Schilling, great to keep alive our love of the game together. Love you, tennis pal. Thanks for sharing your passion for the game with us. Thank you, thank you. You touched briefly on my illness. Cancer is something that no one ever expects, no one ever asked for and you have to deal with it the best you can. I've been blessed by God to have an outstanding partner, caretaker. Talking about Maggie? Maggie, yes. I don't care how humble she tries to make it. She saved my life. She made sure I went through all my chemo, all my radiation, all my doctor appointments. If it weren't for her, I probably wouldn't be here today. God bless you, Mark. God bless Maggie. Thanks again. So Maggie, what's it like spending fun time with Mark Schilling? Um, <laughs> honestly, that's rather hard to describe because Mark is a breed all his own. When I first met him eight years ago, he was in his late 30s and looked like he was 20. Tan, had the kind of long curly hair in the back, still real blonde, you know, wore the caps backwards, always had a tennis racket in his hand. And he was talking about Todd's legs. Well, he had absolutely beautiful legs. He made an impression on me. Mark and I have been friends this whole time. Honestly, I thought he was what I call a play baby because he was always making people laugh. You know, he acted like he was 20. I've never met a person that did not like him. That, I mean, all his doctors, when he was going through his treatments and stuff, um, all just thought the world of him. The nurses, reception staff, just everybody that he deals with just loves Mark. He's got one of those personalities that just kind of grabs you and 
takes a hold of you. It's kind of like the Nike story. I thought that was very, you know, apropos for what you were asking him. These last eight years with Mark have been hard because of his health, but I wouldn't trade him for the world. He's a great guy. He's a great guy, and I am lucky to have had someone like him in my life. Nick, he told me his dream is to get well and to come back on your staff, and that's what's going to keep him going. Well, let's hope so. And remember, everybody, it ain't over till it's over. But we must help people and give them hope that they can stay in this world.